So our first speaker is Stephen Miller. Uh, the presentation is, was put together by Drs. Stephen Miller and Jeff Burgett, who both received their doctorates from the University of Hawaii and have worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service since 1993. Their, their areas of interest include long-term changes in native Hawaiian land cover that will influence stabilization, recovery, and recovery of endangered species. Um, today I'm going to talk a bit about climate change and, and its potential impacts on the, on the, on the uh, recovery and, and maintenance of endangered species in, in the Hawaiian Islands. And I'm going to focus on two particular areas of, of concern. And one is severe weather systems, um, mainly in the form of hurricanes that uh, tra traverse the Pacific Basin. And the other is rainfall patterns in the Hawaiian Islands, or graphically generated rainfall. And I'm going to give you some background on that and then talk about how potential global warming may alter those and influence those patterns. Um, this is a, a picture of the storm tracks that have occurred in the eastern and central Pacific storm basins since 1965. There's over 600 storm systems that have been generated over that time period and uh, the little red area around the Hawaiian Islands is what I'm calling the area of sort of a close encounter with these storm systems that would, would influence the Hawaiian Islands. Um, you can see there's sort of an upper boundary to where these storms go as a result of the colder waters that occur up in north. The storms tend to hit these cold water areas and peter out. <laughs> and these are the storm systems that have transited um, within that red zone where they would influence the Hawaiian Islands since, uh, since 1965. And uh, you can see that uh, the upper boundary white line, you don't really don't get any hurricane systems that move above that, again, because of the cold water systems. And the ones that actually do make it to the Hawaiian Islands are sort of slipping around the, uh, the, the, the western end of that, uh, of that uh, white reference line. And those will become important issues as we go through this talk. You'll get a much better sense of why that's occurring. Uh, this is just a close-up of, of, of those same storm tracks, and uh, you can see where they have intersected the Hawaiian Islands. Again, notice that the two hurricanes in 82 and, and 92 came around through, from the south and moved up into the Hawaiian Islands, and, uh, and the other storm systems um, tend to peter out, drop below hurricane status before they cross that uh, white reference line. Well, this is a... Um, a portrait of sea surface temperatures in the, in the Pacific area. This is from June of this year. And you can see that uh, the orange areas are um, you know, across the equator range from about 25 to 30 degrees centigrade. And the yellow area is about 20 to 25 degrees centigrade. And you can see there's quite a distinctive pattern with Hawaii sitting in the orange, but with a nice yellow area behind, uh, in, to the east of it. And these are the points of origin of those 600 storm systems that have been generated. You can see most of our storm systems occur in the eastern Pacific storm basin. Um, those are the triangles and the squares of the central Pacific storm basin. This is the white reference line that I showed you before. And uh, you can see that the storms that slip around to the west of that line are coming up through warm water and, and moving right into the Hawaiian Islands. And here, of course, are those very same storm systems that I had mentioned. <clears throat> Again, note that uh, the, they, they generally, when they hit that colder water, drop below hurricane status and become tropical storms and, mo and tropical depressions. Well, I want to look at two things in terms of sea surface temperature. One is the sea surface temperature that occurs in the eastern Pacific Basin, um, where, the, where a lot of these storms originate. And the other area is in this uh, waters that are east of the Hawaiian Islands. There, there are these colder waters, and I'll be talking about those two areas, and I'll reference them as we go through the talks, uh, so you'll be able to keep track of what I'm talking about at any particular time. And I'm going to reference them against um, some major changes in sea surface temperatures that occur on a regular basis. Now, this is the 
uh, El Nino body of water that you're very familiar with, and I'm not going to be talking about El Nino events here at all, but this tends to be a body that people are really familiar with. So just as a reference, this is uh, um, water systems that are 20 degrees north and south of the equator that result in, uh, in warming events that occur on very short intervals, 6 to 18 months, and, uh, and occur at a, a rather regular pace. The water system I want to talk about is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's a much longer term cycle that occurs you know, on the order of 20 to 25 years and, uh, and, is, and is generated by analyzing sea surface temperatures north of 20 degrees north latitude. And of course the Hawaiian Islands are sitting right at the bottom of that Pacific Decadal Oscillation data set. And this is what the Pacific Decadal Oscillation looks like. Um, the red are w sea surface temperatures that are warmer than the average um, sea surface temperature, and the white are temperatures that are below the average of the sea surface temperatures. And you can see since 1900, there's been a fairly classic oscill oscillatory event that has taken place. Um, I'll be referring to the, the cool PDO that occurred in 1947 through 19. 76 and the warm PDO from 1977 to 1978. And uh, the reason I have a little question mark after the 1998 date is uh, that the, the weather researchers haven't quite decided if that current warm PDO has ended or not. It's an ongoing discussion. Uh, but there's some good reason to think, reasons to think it has. I tend to uh, put my faith in the anchovies and sardines that have shown a classic capacity to track these PDO events. Um, so just back to the storm systems then that have, have transited across the Hawaiian Islands with reference to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. In the cool period, um, we had about six storms that we were encountered. Note that from 1949 to 56, none of the no storm systems actually entered that, that uh, close encounter zone. And of course, during the war PDO from 77 to 98, we had 12 storms, twice as many storm systems that entered that area. Um, the Central Pacific really didn't contribute much in the way of these, although it, it actually had two systems that were actually hurricane force systems that entered, uh, you know, that, that hit Hawaii. Um, most of them are from the Eastern Pacific, though, as I had pointed out. Um, most of the storms when they reach Hawaii are tropical depressions. But again, uh, you know, more, more storms, more tropical depressions in Hawaii. Some of them are tropical storms when they encounter the Hawaiian Islands. Not too many hurricanes, and usually a very low status, the one exception being Hurricane Iniki, which was a Category 4 storm. Um, this, of course, is as these storms enter the colder water systems that are associated with that uh, cold phase in the, of uh, the cold water to the north, they tend to wither out. But if you look at the potential power of these storms during their entire lives, you can see that uh, during the cold PDO, three of them were tropical storms and only one tropical storm during the hot, the warmer PDO. If you look at uh, um, the hurricanes, there were two hurricane, two low-grade hurricanes during the cold PDO and two low-grade hurricanes during the warm PDO. And high-grade hurricanes, category three and four, um, you see there was only one during the cool P PDO and there were nine that occurred during this, this uh, warm PDO phase. So during the warm PDO, the storm systems actually are quite a bit more active in, in, the, in the Eastern Pacific Basin and Central Pacific Basin and are producing extremely powerful, powerful storms. And just to bring us up to speed, since 1993, there's only been two storm systems that have approached the Hawaiian Islands. Um, they were both tropical depressions by the time they got here, but one of them, again, was a Category 4 hurricane at some point in its early life. <coughs> So let's look at the actual sea surface temperatures where these storms are being generated and see how they relate to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, the little figure up in the, in the top is just uh, the Eastern Pacific Storm Basin, and, and that shows you the area where I'm getting these sea surface temperature data from. Um, that's the spread of data across this phase. Here's the cold Pacific Decadal Oscillation. No significant regression in that data. It's essentially no trend. And the warm Pacific Decadal Oscillation shows a significant increase in temperature over time. And in fact, the temperature increases from uh, 
1977 through 98 as, uh, uh, as much as 0.45 degrees centigrade, which is quite a substantial warming effect. If you look at uh, the eastern colder waters east of the Hawaiian Islands, uh, again looking at the same information, there's no significant regression associated with the cold PDO, and there's no significant regression associated with the warm PDO, but it certainly looks quite a bit different than the cooler PDO in terms of the average mean temperature. And in fact, if you look at the surface temperature increases, it's significantly different. The warm PDO is substantially warmer, 0.3 degrees warmer than the, than, the, uh, than the sea surface temperatures during the cold PDO. So as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation changes sea surface temperatures in the areas of origin, as well as in the colder waters east of the Hawaiian Islands, actually are cycling with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, if we look at the actual storms themselves that have been generated, we can ask a few questions. For instance, we can ask if the duration of the storm season has increased or decreased or changed during those PDOs, and the answer is no. The cold Pacific, during the cold Pacific decadal oscillation, there's, no more, there's just as many storms generated as during the warm PDO. And um, so the duration and the number of storms really hasn't changed as a result of the, of the sea surface temperature changes that have taken place during those, those oscillatory periods. If you look at the number of hurricanes generated during those periods, there's a substantial increase in the number of hurricanes generated during the warm Pacific decadal oscillation. Keep in mind that's a 0.45 degrees increase in sea surface temperature. Um, so it's substantially more hurricanes that occur. Um, the storms that are generated during the warm Pacific decadal oscillation are substantially stronger than they are during the cold Pacific decadal oscillation. Um, and the hurricane phase of those storms is substantially stronger than it is during the cold Pacific decadal oscillation. So all this is leading us to the realization that warming sea surface temperatures associated with this oscillatory phase of, of, of uh, ocean seawater is resulting in an increase in the, numbers of, in the numbers of storms, hurricanes that are occurring, and the strength of the storms, and the strength of the hurricane phases. So it's a, a significant increase in, uh, in, in storm activity. So the question then is, what do we expect as a result of global warming? Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their 2007 report uh, looked at this particular block of ocean in the Pacific and came up with estimates on what, climate, what sort of temperature changes you would anticipate by 2000 and 2100. Um, their results suggested that there would be a minimum surface temperature increase of one and a half degrees centigrade, an average surface temperature degrees of about 2.3 and a maximum of about 3.7 degrees centigrade. So these are pretty significant increases in, in sea surface temperatures. And if you keep in mind that the past increases in the eastern and central Pacific for storm activity is associated with about a 0.3 to 0.4 degrees centigrade rise. That's the temperature changes that, that I've been talking about that directly relate to the increase in storm activity that we've seen over the past um, few decades. So it looks like global warming should actually greatly enhance storm activity in the eastern and central Pacific. And, uh, and that, I think, uh, can be summarized very briefly um, if we simply look at this. Currently, uh, we have a fairly strong Pacific decadal oscillation where and we're entering into a cold phase, so we're going to be pretty much have the protection of colder waters east of the Hawaiian Islands that uh, will help keep storm systems out of the, out of our off our islands for the time being. And uh, and in the in those cold phases, we had smaller storms and that, that were less frequent in occurrence. Um, Global warming, I think we could anticipate that it's going to weaken the Pacific decadal oscillation, or at least it will raise the temperatures of those oscillatory phases so that the colder phase won't be quite as cold and the warmer phase will probably be warmer than it has been in the past. Um, the consequence, I think, is going to be that we're going to have more frequent storms, and those storms are going to be a lot bigger. And because the eastern waters that protected the Hawaiian Islands are going to warm up, they're probably going to be 
storms frequencies impacting the Hawaiian Islands will probably increase significantly over the next hundred years. So with regard to endangered species, what does that imply? Well, these are stochastic storm events. We don't know when they're going to come in. Um, we don't know where they're going to hit. So how do we you know, do, deal with it? Well, so, so global warming is, you know, severe weather is going to become a more common and regular feature of Hawaii's, Hawaii's climate. And as in the past, these storms are going to impact the islands in a fairly random manner. So to protect native species, we need to get them out in, into the field populations that are spread across their full geographic range in as many locations within that range as we can. And uh, for the uh, extremely rare species, we need to maintain them in captive propagation and, and also put species into, uh, into seed storage programs to maintain them for the future. One of the critical questions, though, relative to the landscape is where do we put these rare species? Uh, we need field locations to outplant them across their range. Where are those field locations? Well, global warming is also going to affect rainfall patterns in Hawaii. And of course, rainfall patterns dictate where the major ecosystems in, in, on islands occur. Um, this is just a quick example of what I'm talking about. We have trade winds come in. They result in, as they echo up, they cool off and generate cloud systems, current cloud bases at about 600 meters. Um, there's also an upper elevation inversion at about 1,800 meters. Um, this rainfall gives us our major climates, our vegetation communities, dry, music, wet, and very wet systems. And the amount of area that produces rain can actually, you know, we can get a rough calculation based on this 600 meter cloud base. We can figure out how much mountain area is high enough to generate clouds on each of the islands. Here's the anticipated temperature changes, 1.5, 2.3, and 3.7 as a result of global warming. Um, the current cloud base, as I said, is 600 meters. An increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade is ra will raise that to 831 meters. 2.3 will raise it to 954. And 3.7 will raise the cloud base to 1,169 meters. So the amount of mountain area that can generate clouds um, is actually going to reduce as a result of global warming. So here's what we might anticipate. The trades are still going to blow in nice and wet. The cloud base is going to be elevated. The upper elevation inversion will probably be elevated as well, but that's a little more complex system involving Hadley cell circulation. Um, but the mountain area, the essential element is that the mountain area that produces rain is going to be reduced as a result of global warming. So we'll probably have more dry communities in, in Hawaii, more mesic communities, less wet and less very wet communities, maybe no very wet communities. Um, all this, of course, will be less rain and in a warmer environment as well. So evapotranspiration rates, evaporation and precipitation changes, are, you know, are, are, that ratio is going to change as well. So if you look at the reduction in cloud generating mountain area as a result of global warming, um, if you look at the Big Island, depending on which temperature effects kick in, it can be a 9 to 27 percent reduction in the amount of mountain capable of generating clouds. And in Maui, it's 26 to 48 um, percent know, for those similar things. Um, they have you know, high mountain systems on them, so they're, they are, they're the ones that are the least affected by um, this sort of thing. Kauai, it's going to reduce the amount of mountain that can generate cloud systems by 39 to 79 percent, depending on how much temperatures, surface temperatures increase. Molokai, 48 to 91 percent. Lanai, 80 to 100 percent, and the island of Oahu, 90 to 99 percent reduction in the amount of mountain area capable of generating clouds that stick up high enough to do that. So the implications are, of course, that is, if you don't generate clouds, you don't generate rain. And if you don't generate rain, things dry out. So it's a, you know, fairly straightforward. So in conclusion here, climate change in the form of global warming is likely to significantly alter the landscape structure of Hawaii's ecosystems. Um, those alterations are going to be driven by increased severe weather and a reduction in rainfall, both of which will probably become a much more regular feature of Hawaii's, uh, of Hawaii's climate. What do we need to do? Well, the conservation community, all of you and, and, every, and many others as well, need to evaluate and design and implement conservation programs that can effectively address the impact of climate change. 
And as a starter, I would suggest that uh, the Hawaii Conservation Alliance in their next 2008 forum and conference really begin to try and get a handle on what that means, what does that entail, and how do we go about doing it. Some of the things that we may want to consider in, in that regard is, uh, is a, a, a create a new endeavor called Transition Ecology, in which we learn how to transform a wet forest into a music forest, or a music forest into a dry forest. And also, how do we deal with what are called non-analog ecosystems, ecosystems that begin to show up in the Hawaiian Islands as a result of global warming that have never occurred here before. Um, we certainly have enough invasive species, and the, and the weather systems that we're talking about may actually strongly promote those kinds of, uh, those kinds of ecosystems. Um, the other thing we need to deal with is major long-term captive propagation programs and seed storage programs for many of these species. We have to now start thinking of sustaining them um, on the order of 100 years or more. Um, and, and finally, um, well, the adaptive management circle that uh, probably many of you have seen and referenced over time really isn't a circle anymore. It's a spiral. And the conservation targets that are part of that adaptive man management program are now continually moving and uh, no longer static. And there may, of course, be many other things that uh, also need to be addressed. Thanks.